Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's call. We're so happy you're here. This is the End Stage Renal Disease Network Learning and Action Network series focusing on transplant quality improvement activity. Uh, this is Stephanie Hull, and I'll be your host for today. Before we get started, I just want to go over a couple reminders. We are streaming the audio over the computer speakers. That's going to help to free up phone lines in your facility. If you need to dial in from your phone, send us a message via the chat window and we can assist you. Uh, echoes, echoes are caused from multiple connections to a single event, so please close all but one browser on your computer. And uh, when you're submitting questions and comments, please type the questions and comments in the chat with presenter section located in the bottom left corner of your screen. Uh, this event is being recorded and all the material will be available from your network representative within 10 business days. Uh, this event is also approved for one CEU. So at the end of the presentation, uh, please stay on uh, your computer, stay online, and a post survey will appear. This gives you the opportunity to share your feedback. Uh, after hitting the submit, then uh, your screen, there will be another screen that pops up with the links to the CEU. So we do want your feedback, whether you need CEUs or not, we would appreciate if you take a moment to do the, the uh, survey at the end of this presentation. So reasons for participation in today's LAN. We're going to learn strategies to support patients through their choice of transplant as a modality option. And there's ways to spread the best practices from today's call. You're going to listen and share your approaches and experiences via the chat. You uh, can identify how this shared information could be used at your facility. And uh, while you're listening, uh, think about how you can apply at least one idea from today's land call at your facility, something you can take back and um, share with your staff and uh, members of your team. Um, so before we get started, I just want to take a moment to go over the results of the pre-work survey that um, some of you had the opportunity to do. We had uh, one of our first questions was, does the facility where you work have a list of transplant centers with a defined travel distance? So uh, about almost 89% said yes, they do. 4.5% said no, they do not have a list of transplant centers with a travel distance. And 6% said we would like to but haven't yet. Um, the second question, how, would you, how have you connected to the transplant center or centers closest to the dialysis facility where you work? Uh, about 66% they have regular phone calls with their transplant centers. 4% said they visit the transplant center. 21% say the transplant center visits the dialysis facility. And about 9% said nothing yet but plan to start. So thank you for those who took the time to, to do those pre-work questions. Well, I'm going to introduce our speaker. We actually have two speakers today. The first one is Carolyn Kennedy. She's a licensed social worker practicing in the state of New York since 2009. Currently, she is a social worker for American Renal Association, Associates of Plattsburgh and Elizabethtown in New York. Ms. Kennedy's passion in healthcare is empowering patients to maximize their quality of life by providing education and tools to accomplish their goals. We also have Corinne Vincent. She is the clinical manager with American Renal Associates of Plattsburgh in Plattsburgh, New York. Ms. Vincent has worked as a staff nurse in the acute and outpatient units for four years before becoming the clinical manager. Her commitment to the end-stage renal pop disease population shows through her hard work to optimize patient quality of life, outcomes, open communication, and comfort in their outpatient modality. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the presentation to Corinne and Carolyn. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining the call. Um, what we wanted to do today is just share our experience in supporting patients with transplant. Um, it's, specific, it's a specifically rural experience. Uh, and I know that a lot of you may share that. So um, I'm hoping that we can share some ideas that might help you. Next slide. So 
So essentially what we want to do is have you understand your area transplant teams and their requirements. Um, encourage empathy, support, and persistence in specific ways. Empower, help teach how to empower patients to help themselves when it comes to transplant. And um, encourage connecting patients to each other for knowledge and support. Next slide. A little bit about our experience in northern New York. Um, HK Friedman Renal Center is located in Plattsburgh, New York in Clinton County. Uh, our county population is about 80,000 people over 1,118 square miles. So for comparison, Albany County, our capital district, is about 307,000 people over 533 miles. So it's much more population dense than we are up here. Um, so HK Friedman Renal Center serves Clinton County and some patients in Essex County, our neighbor county to the south. Um, but the interdisciplinary team is shared between HK Friedman Renal Center and Elizabethtown Center, which is a smaller unit in Essex County. So what you hear today reflects the strategies of both those units. The U.S. Census Bureau for Clinton County population estimates is that we have about a 14% poverty rate. We have approximately 25,000 per capita income per year, and we're about 92% white, and the majority of persons are aged 18 to 65. Just to give you an idea of, of where we're coming from. Um, we have found that barriers to transplant in rural areas are the long distances to traverse, not just to the transplant hospital, but sometimes to other specialists as well. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, though Medicaid uh, can cover transportation to medically necessary specialists, those who don't qualify for Medicaid can struggle to cover those costs. Um, long distances can be time consuming for patients already devoting a large chunk of their time to dialysis. Um, care Coordination can be a barrier sometimes. Some providers and transplant hospitals want their testing done at their hospital rather than accepting testing closer to the patient's home. It can be harder for dialysis and transplant teams to meet and coordinate when we're further away from each other. Next slide. Uh, another barrier in, in our rural area we've found is medical illiteracy. It's, we have a lot of very um, hardworking and um, good people around here, but they don't always trust the medical system or doctors sometimes, or they may sometimes put too much trust in the doctors and the system, um, expecting things to get fixed for them. They might not be used to advocating for themselves. Uh, they could be fearful of surgeries or interventions. They might be waiting for a doc referral. Um, they might be feeling helpless or powerless and that this is just out of their league of understanding. So what we do with that is just try to assess their capabilities to understand medical knowledge and tailor education to their abilities. Um, try to make them feel comfortable with their medical condition and their experience in the medical environment as much as possible. Next slide. So our options um, that we've uh, come to know, the closest options are the University of Vermont Medical Center in Burlington, Vermont, and that's about an hour and a half to two and a half hours drive with a ferry. Um, Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York is about a three to four hour drive. And the State University of New York Upstate Medical University in Syracuse is a, is a four to six hour drive. Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Vermont is four to five hours away. And New York Presbyterian Hospital, Cornell in New York, New York is a five to six hour drive. So it really is a, a challenge for, for people are going to have to traverse a long distance to get to these transplant hospitals. Next slide. Okay, we have our first uh, polling question here for the audience. 
So how far is the nearest transplant center to your facility? So the uh, responses are starting to come in. We'll just uh, wait just a little bit and make sure it gives everybody an opportunity to answer the question. Uh, we're over 300 total responses, and I th will close that uh, polling in three, two, and one. So how far is the nearest transplant center to your facility? 54.5% uh, said less than one hour, 28% said between one to two, uh, almost 15% between two and four, and there's this about 3% that's saying over four hours. Wow, that seems pretty impressive. We, I didn't realize that was the case, but we, yeah. our patients really are very far from, from their nearest transplant centers comparatively. And then they have the cost associated with getting to mm -hmm. those transplant centers, especially yeah. when you put like a ferry. Yeah, yeah. And those additional. Challenge. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so how are interdisciplinary dialysis teams use transplant? We think of transplant as a, a very personal choice may be informed by how much investment has to go into to actually even getting there. Um, it's a lot of mental, emotional, and physical work for a person and for their family. It's time consuming and we all know that it really doesn't end with surgery. A whole new life of medical interventions and potential complications might begin. Um, how we address the barriers and challenges to transplant in our experience, we accept that they may have potential misgivings. We help them integrate their, their personal goals with their treatment goals. And we know those two things might be in conflict and might take some time to integrate. We seek to empower the patient with empathy, support, and persistence. And we do what we can to help with the nuts and bolts, but we strongly feel they'll be successful when they are in charge of their own life and their own process. Next slide. So as far as understanding your transplant teams and requirements, things you can ask uh, yourself or get together for your patient, where can patients get a transplant? Know your centers. Who will be helping them get a transplant? Um, connect with the team. And what do the teams want to know? Uh, try to streamline your referral. Next slide. As far as where can they get a transplant, things you want to know would be to uh, locate the names, addresses, and contact information for each hospital within a certain radius. If your patient's willing to travel long distances, you might want to work case by case with them. And, and long distances, we're talking um, flights, you know, people who are willing to take flights to different states or go out of state. Um, transplant hospitals are all registered with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services organ procurement and transplantation network. Um, and the, there's a link below. You can search, when you go to that link, you can search their member directory in several ways to get the information you need to reach out to the transplant hospital. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, they can look, take a look at that. And um, I'll go on to the next piece. You could, this is a member directory here, so you can just search for what you're looking for. Um, and then once you have the information you need, you can catalog your findings in a binder, a file, a spreadsheet, whatever system works for your team, and keep that information handy. Um, or make copies to put around the unit, for example, around the charge nurse desk, or the front desk or lobby, by the scale. Our patients have identified the scale as a, as a uh, key place for them to find out new things. Next slide. Um, distance is going to be relative to every patient's motivation and resources. Um, try not to choose for them. Remind them that they can go as far as away as they want to uh, and as they're able. If they're eligible for Medicaid and they have Medicaid, that should cover their transportation and expenses, even food and hotel um, stipends to a medically necessary hospital or treatment center that's not available to them locally. There ha there, obviously, there's paperwork that goes with that, but we did have a patient who was transported from Plattsburgh to Boston, which is um, 
about a five to six hour drive. I think they I think they did have to take a bus, um, but they did get a stipend for a hotel and for per diem food. Because of her specific situation, she needed to go to that hospital versus one of the other hospitals that we mentioned. So it, it, it's doable um, with, with some diligence with the paperwork. Next slide. So as far as who, helping them understand who will be helping them to get a transplant, um, once you have all that information for your go-to teams, give them a call and connect with someone, uh, whoever you feel comfortable with. As a social worker, I reach out to other social workers. I notice our nurses like to reach out to the other charge nurses or uh, ward nurses. Any other team member or the coordinator would most likely, most likely be very happy to connect with the dialysis unit. Decide whether you could take time to visit the transplant center or offer for them to visit your unit and in service your staff or do a lobby day for your patients. Try to build a professional relationship with your contact on that team so that you can feel comfortable calling each other up and consulting more easily on shared patients. Um, we, you know, we, they're just as busy as we are and what I've come to learn with my contacts and my relationships is that they would love to have more coordination with dialysis and it would make everybody's life and job easier and certainly the process perhaps easier for the patient too, I would hope. Um, you could be a great advocate for your patients when the team knows you better. Next slide. So what do the teams want to know and how do we streamline referrals? Um, now that you know which hospitals around you do the transplants and you've connected with the team, just ask what they want from you for referrals. There will still be some information the transplant team or hospital could use from you as a dialysis team. So if you know the records they want to receive, you can create records releases with the names of the transplant hospitals pre-filled so that and just copy them, you know, Xerox them off, so that when a patient expresses an interest, you can get a signed off authorization to communicate with that hospital pretty quickly. Um, you can create a fax cover sheet for each transplant team or hospital with a list of the records that they need just for your own reminder so you can quickly gather those records and fax them right over. Um, you could use the established fax cover sheet to share the responsibility among the dialysis team, maybe even the nephrologist offices as well. If you've done the work of finding out what exactly they'd like, you know, a demographic sheet and medications and insurance, then, and it's written right there on your fax cover, then anybody could grab one and put those things together and fax it over. It doesn't have to all fall on one person's shoulders. Um, each transplant team and hospital might be different in what they want, so it's good to know what their requirements are. Uh, for example, Albany Medical Center wants each candidate to attend a seminar, so they're happy to get our referral, but until a, can a candidate makes that trip down to Albany, and attends their educational seminar, they're not going to move forward. Um, same with University of Vermont Medical Center. They ask that the patients call themselves to self-refer. Um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock does prefer a physician referral form. However, they've said that if somebody calls themselves and gets the process started, they're not going to stop them. But our transplant teams are each different and have different requirements and are all also looking for patients who are pretty self-motivated and self-directed to, um, to get the process started. Next slide. Okay, we have our uh, second polling question here for the participants. What ways to streamline the referral process do you, would benefit your patients? So we opened up the polling and participants are starting to answer the questions. So we'll give them a little bit of time to submit their answers. And um, they're coming in pretty quickly right now. So. so all right, I'll close the polling in three, two, and one. Okay. so. Uh, what ways to streamline the referral process would benefit patients? So almost 32% said a binder with the local transplant centers. 10% uh, said the fax cover sheet for each transplant center. 
um, almost 26% shared referral process with the team, and 32% said the treatment center's requirement for uh, referrals. So, great. So, um, empathy, support, and persistence. I think we're all pretty well versed in how to provide those things. That's kind of what we do when we work with our, with our patients. But to, to quantify it a little bit, ask yourself, I guess, are you a fixer um, or are you an expert? You know, what are your, what's your angle on how you're helping your patients? Are you trying to do things for them or do you know what they need more than they know what they need? You might want to evaluate those questions for yourself. Maybe you need, maybe there's something that you can learn from them, or maybe there's things that they need to fix for themselves. Um, start where the patient is is always a good place to start. What was dialysis in their life plan? Even if they were prepared, are they here much sooner than they thought they would be doing dialysis? And what impact is that having on their process? Uh, are they struggling to accept the diagnosis? How sick do they feel? And how disruptive will this treatment be to their personal and professional life? Because all of those questions, the answers to those questions are going to affect how much they're going to be able to own the transplant process. Next slide. So um, in continuation, just be sensitive to where they're at personally with transplant. Um, this is a big undertaking for, for every patient. Maybe um, are they fearful or adamantly opposed? Are there religious barriers, personal beliefs that might conflict with getting a transplant? Have they been transplanted before? Um, or if their transplant failed, how has that affected their perspective? Um, could they actually be satisfied with their dialysis modality and does it work for them? Um, we do see that happen with some people. We do have um, a lot of elderly people in our population and some, some of them feel like this is where it works for them. This is, this is the, the sweet spot. So have they, another issue that we found is have they been told that they're not a candidate and does that discourage them to be continually talked to about a treatment option? they aren't eligible for. Next slide. Um, the support piece. You know, as you facilitate and monitor their adjustment alongside them, dovetail their treatment options education with their goals and help them see the relevance of other options to their life. Um, try not to argue with them about options and we don't outright argue or fight, of course, but what what might seem like a good fit to the team um, could still be very in intimidating or just plain out of the question in their current perspective. Um, so be patient with your patient's process. We, we had a patient who would have been a perfect candidate for PD, perfect from our perspective, mm -hmm. but this patient wasn't going to entertain the idea, barely wanted to even know about it, just knowing that there would be a catheter and her, her abdomen was just out of the question completely. So, um, you know, we, we still worked on it, and actually that patient got transplanted. Mm -hmm. So that was a good thing, but we got to be patient with, with their process and understanding what's happening to them. Um, facilitating their adjustment to dialysis and diagnosis will help them feel ready to confront the transplant journey. So the sooner they feel comfortable or more comfortable with where they're at, which maybe might mean they feel less comfortable because they really want to get off dialysis, and that might help them confront the, the transplant journey more. Um, with, their patient, with their permission, engage their family. They're, they're going to end up needing the support from their family. Um, help them build resilience. Provide them with encouragement. Remind them how far they've come and help them see how much they really are capable of. Um, sometimes people fall into our dialysis chairs feeling very helpless and, and take some time to get back on their feet and get back to the business of, of living, which they were doing very well before all that started. Or um, this is such a, an ongoing everyday process of adjustment. 
it, some patients have found it very helpful to, to have that reminder to look back to wh how, were you, how, do, how are you feeling now versus how you were when you first started. And mm -hmm. sometimes they haven't asked themselves that question and, and it helps them see they, they really have adjusted quite a lot more than they thought. Next, or go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that something that's important for us to recognize is in with regards to discussing with the patients is we don't want them to feel cornered or that um, they feel they need to build walls. Um, we need to work together with them to get to that point where they accept which way they want their life to go, be it transplant or whichever modality um, is the best choice for them. Right. Yeah. It, right. Instead of shaking the finger, you know, you need to do this. You've got. Why haven't you done this mm -hmm. yet? You know, it's really just where are you at with that? How do you feel about it? Mm -hmm. Next slide. <coughs> uh, providing support as a unit, um, everybody together. Everybody has a role in in supporting and and n not doing the finger wagging. Um, you know. You got to get yourself on a transplant list, and how come you're still here? And you're supposed to call. And you know, sometimes we we hear those things, and we want to minimize that and and really let them be in charge of their own destiny. Um, establish your unit strategy for discussing transplant with patients. So, is that everybody's job, or is it nobody's job? Is it where who's the person, the main person responsible, or is are is everybody? have an equal stake in talking about it. Uh, keep a log of the patients who are listed, who want to be listed, who aren't sure yet, or are ineligible. Make it accessible to anyone who educates or talks to patients about transplant. And make it whatever you want it to be, whatever is going to help your team get a snapshot idea of what your, trans, your, your patient population looks like relative to transplant. And you know, this is in process for us right now as well. It's not like we have this uh, perfected. This is something that we are, we are in the process of, of getting right so that we can look at our population in a snapshot and see who, who are, who's going where and who's going to stay on dialysis. Um, talk with your team. Sometimes patients seem to have different opinions based on who they might be talking to. They might need some more emotional support or information. Um, they just might be sick of saying the same thing to everybody, or you know, they, they might be having a bad day that day, and you know, somebody heard them express some frustration, and another person talked to them on a different day and didn't didn't hear that. Um, so we just keep talking together. They're always part. They are always part of the team. Next slide. So the persistence piece. Um, persistence is, aside from what we've said about not, we don't want to finger wag, we don't want to push people or push them into a corner. Um, they are often so overwhelmed at the beginning, they might not have any room in their mind for other modalities or transplants. Though, so part of persistence is just trusting the process and just sticking with it over time as a team, knowing that we'll get there. We will get there. We don't have to. We don't have to push them into this right now. Um, offer an options check-in every few weeks or months, um, and as they adjust, they might change their outlook. Um, don't don't give up on the patient who's taking longer to adjust the idea of transplant. Um, I don't think any of us give up on patients in that sense, and, you know, but if sometimes some people take a lot longer, longer than others to come around. Um, balance your goals with their goals, and and try to really understand where they're coming from. Maybe if you keep discussing, you know, what is your life like right now, go at it from a different perspective. What, what is your daily life like right now? What are your challenges every day? Maybe you can start to understand why they don't feel like they can fit transplant in right now. Uh, if you can see that they're caring for other people and they have to go here and there or they can't drive anymore or they got to rely on people for rides, you know, 
people around here aren't going to want to ask somebody to drive them five hours away to a hospital several times, um, even once a year. So once you can understand what they're really experiencing, you might understand a little bit more why they haven't taken that information you gave them about the transplant hospital and called. So our motto is be persistent, but don't work harder than the patient either. As long as you're persisting in providing empathy, education, and support tailored to your patient, then you've offered the tools and they'll need to pick up those tools when they're ready. Not all patients can have or want a transplant and we need to save some energy for those too. So we want to focus on those patients who, who can't have a transplant or, or you know, obviously we, we have to divide our time carefully. So as long as we're offering the tools to the patients that, that are eligible, that, w that we know could be eligible, if they could get evaluated, um, and, and we stick with that, stick with offering, continuing that offer, then I think we're doing what we need to do. Next slide. Um, empowering the patient to help themselves. So if they have expressed definite interest, always communicate that to your team and maybe also with the patient permission to the transplant team with your, your cover sheet and your records. So have those authorizations ready and available. It's, 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 you know, a lot of uh, our, our days kind of come down to tasks and that's one task that could go on a list or could go on your desk, but if you have that stuff handy and you can get it right in the fax machine and get it going, say, hey, we've got authorization to, to share with, with you, um, University of Vermont or whatever your hospital is, that this person would like a transplant. You could give them a call real quick. If you have your contact established, you can say, hi, so-and-so. I wanted to let you know that our patient, Mr. or Mrs. this or that or the other, at this phone number and address would really like to uh, talk about transplant. Could you give them a call? Um, always encourage them to take charge of that process. Give them that contact information over and over. If you see they don't really seem to make a move, maybe they're not ready. And maybe you can encourage them to think about their goals and whether, that, whether dialysis fits in with those goals or not. And if it doesn't, then maybe it's time to consider transplant. Um, Tell them what you know about what a transplant team or hospital wants for a referral. Tell them, you know, I need all I need to do is gather this, this, and that, and then I can send it right over. Um, it is a big commitment. It's a lot of work. Maybe motivational interviewing techniques. You know, what's their goal for themselves and their life? Um, what are they trying to move towards? And is there are their actions moving them towards those things that they want? Or are they ambivalent? Um, do they need more family engagement? Is it just that they don't want to pursue it because they feel like it would be too much of a burden on the family to have to go these far places to, to do this? Uh, just listen to them. Um, if they're dragging their feet, do they really want a transplant? Ask them what they think a transplant will involve and answer their questions. Get them to where they can even ask questions and you know, what does that mean for me? Next slide. Uh, knowledge really is power. So an education station might help them visualize all the information that they're bombarded with by us. Um, try to keep some handouts re readily available. Make them colorful, appealing, clear, easy to read. Um, most people have a hard time learning about something they don't feel is relative, relevant to them or that they can't visualize. So, you know, how is this relevant to you or, or what does this look like? What, I know um, myself, I'm not very good with listening to information or I need to see information and everybody, everybody's going to have their own preferences for what they like. So get, we get to know what, they, what their preferences are. Um, What's their actual understanding of their condition? Um, we've come across a patient who nods and smiles and says, 
oh, everything's good and everything's great. And so when when do I get to stop doing dialysis? And you know, even though we've been kind of educated or thought we were educating for years on the same topic, so and it's not a it's not a person who has a cognitive cognitive impairment. It's just somebody that just wasn't kind of thinking in, you know. So um, sometimes we just sort of go or on a merry-go-round, and we need to stop and reassess and is this are you really truly understanding of your condition? How can you help yourself by knowing your condition better? Next slide. This is our education station. Um, it's a little uh, low tech, but, <laughs> but it works. <laughs> uh, make it we made it bright to get attention and keep the topics in line. Um, I made it eye eye catching, I guess, and then. It, the information was kept in terms that patients could understand. Um, the, the visuals there were just helpful to provide some clarity. It's hard to see, but we did list the transplant centers with some pictures and also pictures of the transplant physicians. Um, because I know that you know our folks up here like to put a face to a name. So it maybe was helpful for them to see or I thought maybe it would be helpful for them to see who these doctors are that might be, you know, giving them a new kidney. Um, so just have fun with it and let your patients have fun with it and teach your heart out. Next slide. So facilitating connections between patients, um, connecting them to each other for knowledge and support. Is always a good thing. Uh, one great thing that we had was on her own, and this, it, her doing this taught me that this could be something interesting to do or ask people if they're interested in, is to bring, she brought in her own calling cards with her contact info um, to hand out to any interested patients who wanted to talk about modalities because she had been on all the modalities and, um, or trans, and she got transplanted, so we, we don't, see her anymore, luckily, because she's doing very well, but she had the, the very kind uh, gesture of bringing that in and offering herself. And I have handed out those cards several times to people who want to hear from another patient what a transplant is really about. Um, capitalize on the connections that they're already making with each other. I mean, sometimes I'm surprised by how well our patients really know each other. There's a couple of them I can observe that are just sitting there talking to each other, almost the whole treatment. Um, they know each other from outside our dialysis unit. We are a smaller area, but a lot of people have connections with each other outside of dialysis. Maybe they've known each other for years and years. Um, they are looking, there are some who are looking to connect with others, and they start off with small talk, or, or, um, or sometimes even they start off with a grumble or, or something like that, but whatever it is, they connect with each other and um, that works for them. So capitalize on that, maybe ask them, do, you know, do, would you like to connect with other patients? Would you, would you give me authorization to, to um, refer other patients to talk to you? Or, or you could have them on, on hand as somebody that other patients could talk to you know, if they give you the, their authorization. There's, they could become a, a facility representative, a PAC representative. Um, there's lots of ways to capitalize on their connections because some, some of these folks are really interested in, in making, making friends and, and they've developed their own support group in the unit, which, you know, which brings the, up the topic of a support group. A support group is always a good idea for people who are going through a, a, a certain experience because sharing that experience with others can be very healing. Um, that a group for our unit is a goal as well. We, we did attempt to, to start a group um, several years ago. It, it didn't pan out very well, but I think there's some different things that we could consider. And then what I also see too is that our patients who want support or who are reaching out for support have, have developed connections. They, they kind of organically develop those connections with each other here. So, Developing a support group that, that doesn't add extra onto their time. I think there's been a lot of ideas from Network 2 that, with recently on patient and family engagement about how to, con how to 
start a support group in your unit. So um, the network's always a good resource for ideas on that topic too. Um, With reference to utilizing patients that have had a transplant coming into the unit, um, we have seen where patients have been motivated seeing the person that sat in the chair next to them for mm -hmm. months or years not have to come back for a good reason, and okay. then that gives them the motivation. It settles the fear and helps them move forward with um, coming to terms with the, the steps they want to take with their life. Right, yeah, that's, that's been great. I mean, I love it when our transplant patients come back, and we always encourage them to come, across, come around the unit and, and see people, because you, you know, you can't share a whole lot of information, so I think when people get used to seeing one another, you can't always share what happened to the person that I, where is that person? And it's great for them to see they're, they're doing great and they look wonderful because our transplant patients always come in looking wonderful and healthy and glowing with, in, in, in very good spirits. So encouraging your transplant patients, hey, when you, when that, when you get that call, after your few months, when you can come back into you know regular population, come come back and talk to us and see us and encourage our other patients, and it makes a big difference. So next slide. I think that's the end of your slide deck. So uh, before we go into the questions, I just want to remind everybody because there was a couple of questions that came in through the chat about the copies of this presentation today. As a reminder, uh, these will all be sent out to your network representatives within 10 business days. Um, they will go out a little late just because of the holiday next week, but they will be all sent out to your network representatives and they will be sharing it with all the facilities. So, um, And uh, if you do want to submit any questions for the presenters, please use our chat box. Um, we do have a couple questions I'm going to go ahead and um, get started at. So uh, Erica says, what is the process or who do we contact for Medicaid to pay for the patient, hotel and food, when going to the appointment medically outside the region or the city? Um, so in New York State, that is handled through a uh, third party that the Department of Health and the state have hired called Medical Answering Services. I think what you would want to do is connect with your local Department of Social Services um, because the reason I put, I put that piece of information in this presentation was that I, I have read that it is, a, it is a benefit of Medicaid from the state, that all states should have a version of this um, ability to provide transportation. Your state, <coughs> may have other limitations. I, it, in, in our state, we did, in fact, have that patient that got um, bus to Boston and stayed overnight. And I didn't even know that it was possible until they had been resourceful enough to ask a Medicaid caseworker and got the right information and the, and the right forms for, for us to fill out. So it's worth asking either the local DSS or your local office for the aging. They are usually experts on, on Medicaid, or even go to the CMS Medicaid website and, and ask you know, what the coverage for transportation is, and they should be able to explain, explain that usually in their FAQs or in a listing of what their benefit is for transportation. It does have to be medically necessary to go beyond a certain distance. So even and 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 if you if it it can't be based on preference. It's not that the patient would prefer to go to this hospital or to this doctor. It's that no other doctor or hospital is available in in this area. That's the that's the closest one that we can find. So there's definitely some limitations, but it's worth looking into. Great, thank you. And actually, um, Kathy had a comment in her state. I'm not sure which state that is. Every Medicaid and insurance plan has a transplant coordinator. You can ask uh, for who helps. So that they, it may it sounds like it might vary definitely from state to state. You just have to check. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, a question here, maybe a little comment, but maybe you can help 
since there's a turnover with staff, how can a person backtrack to obtain all the missing letters from the transplant team as far as a rejection or acceptance, especially with the older patients who have been on dialysis for a long time? So what we have done is when we get the letter from the transplant center or the patient provides us that information, um, that gets put into their paper record. Um, we have a transplant tab. So any information pertaining to transplant being it good, bad, or you know, what have you, um, that goes under that tab. That way there's a quick reference for anybody coming in that needs to look at that section. And it doesn't usually get thinned out with the chart. Um, it will stay in, in that chart so you can refer back to it if they're not quite sure of the details. Good. Um, thank you. There's uh, Patricia says, have you considered providing an online support group? I, I think so. I think it's been murky with like a, with a, with social media and you know how do we um, protect patients? How do we protect confidentiality? And yeah. you know it would have to go through, through our compliance. And I think it's a great idea mm -hmm. of a Facebook group. I know there's a lot of Facebook groups out there, um, and I have recommended that patients, if they are on Facebook, to go and search for that. Search for that mm -hmm. on Facebook. Search for it on. Um, on other social media websites, LinkedIn or um, oh, there's another big one I'm thinking Instagram. Yeah, you know, so it, I I I have encouraged them to to consider googling it, and if they don't feel comfortable, that we could do that together. On um, we we could try to find an online support group. Um, there is so much online support, and for our more tech savvy population, that's a, a definite option. A couple of them have found resources. Actually, one of them got connected to a, um, a research study by doing that. Got herself put on a list to be a part of a, of a study for an artificial transplant. I don't think that that's like the artificial kidney. I don't think that that's come to fruition for, for this particular patient, but it was something it was something that gave her hope and it was something interesting and, and appealing for her to see that, you know, there's a lot of other people out there who's going through this stuff too. Okay. I think that's a great idea. Great. Um question in from Robin. Is there anything being done to help change the VA system to allow the VA payment for local transplants? Our veterans are told they have to travel to Philadelphia from Maine for a transplant if the VA is covering it. Have you had any experience with that? Uh, I personally have not. Um, most of our VA patients that we have up here are World War II vets. So they're elderly um, with multiple comorbids. Um, I'm trying to think. The, the VAs have generally yeah. authorized dialysis, but yes, when it comes to transplant, if the VA is going to cover it, they want them to go to the transplant yeah. center. I don't know what workarounds there are for that. They'll they'll authorize the the, the dialysis local to the patient, but transplant seems to be a different story. And we haven't honestly had a lot of VA transplants. Um, I'm not sure that in my experience being here, we've had even one VA transplant. All of them have been at those hospitals that I, that that I mentioned. That we've discussed, yeah. So I'm sorry, I can't really speak to that very much. I think that would be maybe one of those centers like closer to Albany, because they have a yeah. VA center down there. Right. Well, and it's going to be a federal, it's going to be a federal VA question, really. Um, they would have to answer the question. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, another question: How do you get physicians to not push patients into transplant when they are not ready? I think it's just part of the interdisciplinary team discussions. Mm -hmm. um, we. If we're doing chair-side care plans or rounds, um, there's discussions that happen ahead of that to kind of um, 
prepare as to the discussions that have happened when either Carolyn or nursing or the physician um, has been around or has not been at that location. Um, well, this is part of the dovetailing goals. Yeah. You know, there the, sometimes the team has a goal or, or the physician or whoever has a goal for the patient that is different from the goal that the patient has for themselves. And I think a, a good use of or a good reason why there's um, multiple people on the team is because with those different relationships and interactions with the patients, it can, we can help the, the physician or we can try to help the physician see where the patient's coming from. Um, we can try to explain, listen, they don't have anywhere, they don't have any support at home, or they don't, they don't want a surgery. You know, they, they, we, we have a patient who is happy as a clam on PD and was getting a little pushed. And, and at what, you know, it took some time to just sit with that patient and say, so what, what do you really want? I mean, sometimes we sort of move ahead um, quickly for our we are for our ideal patients who are just like they we gotta get a transplant right now, you know, they we get so excited about it, we sometimes move past what the patient is looking for because they may be someone who sits there and says, Yes, or okay, or yeah, I'll do that, or sure. If that's what you think, then that's what I'll do. Those are the kinds of those are the ways that the patient's trying to tell us that that's not what they want, that they're doing what we want. And if you tell you take Sometimes I don't know that you can get, you can make a, a physician change their mind, but you can try to use your position or your role in the team to say, this is the conversation that I had with so and so. They say that they're very happy with their life right now, and, mm -hmm. and transplant is scary. It's fearful for them. They don't want to be explained the risks, and yet no providers are going to put, are going to transplant the patient without explaining the risks, the risks of it. But hearing the risks causes a lot of anxiety for this person, and they just don't want anything to do with it. And it's not even a fear. It's just that they're happy. That I like my life. I'm happy with my modality. Right. Dialysis works for me. Um, so if you can get yourself where the patient is at, and you can be that advocate with the physician to say, Listen, let's, we're not going to, you know, again, we're not going to give up on the patient, but here's where so-and-so is at. They're not ready for this step. Um, how about we just let them do the, let them support what their goal is right now and maybe try to offer some education about, hey, if, well, that would be different if you weren't on dialysis or this would be different if you weren't on dialysis or just um, a, Respect their right to self-determination. You know, that's this is their life. This is their treatment choice. Their modality. Maybe they don't want to change. Right. And maybe they're happy. And that's what yeah. we want. We want happy patients. <laughs> we want people satisfied with their life. Right. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, I I want to read. We're getting close to the end, but I do want to read. Actually, there's some comments. There was quite a bit that came in after regarding the VA question. Uh, and it, um, I'm just going to read a couple of them. They're not really questions. They just uh, were people who submitted what's happening with some of their patients. Uh, one says, uh, in Las Vegas, the VA patients have to go to Portland, Oregon. Uh, another one says, in Virginia, the patient has had the uh, VA reimburse him for travel costs from here to Southern California to both, or to both Houston, here in Southern California to go to Houston or Portland. Another one says that in Miami, each VA patient is considered on a case-by-case -case at the local transplant. And then one more comment, in Maine, there's a new law that provides the VA patients to go to the Maine transplant pro uh, program. So I'm, it's sounding like these are really state-dependent and new things are changing. So back to the original question about the VA, I mean, I think you have to work within the VA system and maybe go back and see if there's any changes, but definitely a lot of uh, chatter that came up about the VA patients. So um, yeah, I think, let me see, let's do one more, uh, I think, and then we probably need to wrap it up. So what are the ideas or things we can do for patients to be eligible for transplant if they were denied due to other medical or physical ailments? 
Um, well, I mean, sometimes it's just it's a it's a waiting period. Like for you know cancer, you have a waiting period depending on the type of cancer for three years, five years. Um, other complications. It's the it's to support those patients that need to lose weight. There's some programs that that's a requirement that they use. They lose a certain percentage, so it's just you know getting them in with the dietitian, you know, so the staff and the nurses supporting and encouraging you know their weight loss and their fluid gains and their blood pressure control. You know, helping the patient see the positives in having to wait. Right, or or doing what they can, what's within their control, mm -hmm. to to get eligible. Um, so, yes, it is it is a a multidisciplinary approach. Your weight loss is a dietitian oriented approach, but also psychological. I mean, it is also a social work approach. Sometimes it's about those psychological barrier barriers a person has and, and the reasons that they turn to food or that they turn to food for support. Um, so sometimes it's about, you know, I've had conversations with people about, as a social worker, about their weight. And, you know, you try not to go over your scope, and I don't make recommendations on diet. Um, I always offer that we talk about that with the dietitian or that they talk about that with the dietitian, but I can talk to them about their feelings about food or their feelings of, or, or their barriers or what it is that they're finding challenging about losing weight. So um, I think that that's one aspect. But other, other complications, you know, we have to find out what, what those things are and what, where they need to be, where the transplant team wants them to be in order to consider them and help with making the appointments or doing the referrals mm -hmm. or faxing over the information. I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's simple stuff, but simple isn't always easy. So <laughs> you just have to get an idea of what it is that the, the team wants and try to make it happen. Okay, thank you so much. And so we are close to the end of our time, and I, so I'll just kind of in closing here, just want to thank everybody certainly that took time out of their busy day to uh, participate in our transplant land. It is the last one of this year. Um, I also want to thank again Carolyn Kennedy and Corinne Vincent for taking time too to uh, get their slide deck and present this afternoon with a lot of good uh, best practices. Um, if you have promising practices at your facility that you would like to share, we are looking for speakers for next year. So please, we want to hear from you. So submit uh, that through the uh, NCC info um, mailbox. Um, our next transplant QIA land is going to be January 21st, 2020. Uh, we're going to keep the same schedule. It's the third Tuesday of every month, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They will be starting again after the first of the year. And as always, you can follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. And I just want to say in closing, just thank you again, everybody. Everybody enjoy the um, rest of their holiday season, the rest of this year. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next year. Take, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.